Hi, everybody. Welcome to a brand new All Access interview on Film Music Media. I'm Kai Savas here, and I'm sitting with the amazing Ben Lovett, uh, composer extraordinaire. Ben, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. Very kind words. Yeah, so uh, we did an interview, I think, way, way back. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to put a start fresh for anybody who maybe is discovering you for the first time or just wants to you know, learn more about your background. I'm sure we talked about this in some fashion years ago, but um, tell me kind of what sparked your interest in music. Do you remember kind of that moment? It, was there a moment in childhood where you're like, oh, I'm really kind of interested in this or was it something that happened gradually? Were you immersed in it? Did you have to go find it? Did it seek you out? I'm curious if, you, if there was kind of a moment like that at mm. all. I think there were probably a few. I think that it was something that was sort of burrowing its way in there well, way before I was aware of it. Um, and that was uh, having grown up in a very rural part of middle Georgia. Yeah. I didn't grow up learning to play music or I didn't, I didn't go to music school or have piano lessons or anything like that. I just had my dad who loved the Beatles <laughs> and my grandmother who would take me to church. And so my dad would like drive and air drum all the Ringo fills on the steering wheel and kind of like sing along. And he would always sing the harmony parts. And I think there were, to my little child brain, I think it started to, before I was aware that it was sort of teaching me that those things were there, you know, yeah. that, that they were these independent supporting elements to a song. And, um, and then my grandmother would take me to church with her, which seemed to always be like 25 people and they all seemed to be related and they would basically just sing hymns the whole time. And that was kind of my music education until I was a teenager and this like kid moved to town from another town and he played guitar. And it was like one of the first times I met like somebody else that was into like punk rock and like stuff that I was getting to as a teenager and he could like play yeah. power chords and I was like wow how can I can you teach me how to do that so that was kind of the turning point or the introduction or like the um the eureka moment of like oh you can just do that and then you just do that anywhere and you that's that's how you play so it was a very um um pedestrian a very simple <laughs> entry point into it but yeah. that that was kind of like uh, the foundation of my my kind of musical education. And so at what point did it morph into a point where it's like, okay, this can actually be my career now? When did it, when did it go from just like, this is a hobby I'm really interested into it to a point like, oh, I can actually pursue this and make a living out of it. That, was it always a dream for you to just pursue music or did, was it where you have somewhere else in life that you're going and then went to music i'm curious about that well the jury's still out on if i can make a living at it or not but I, <laughs> I uh it did you know it's like the strange thing about it was so my my little punk rock entry point into self-learning the guitar i was a teenager i was probably like 17 and then it was only like three years later or two years later that i was in college and met a group of kids making to to make a movie in college and I was kind of tricked into doing the music for it, even though, you know, I tried to convince them that was a very bad idea. So I just kind of started doing it. And then I did another one. And then, you know, it was, uh, before you know it, you've done a few of these things. And so for a long time, I never really considered it was something that like I do or that was a right. viable career path or anything like that. It was sort of, it was something I had done Maybe it was a coincidence that I had done it more than once. Um, I thought I could have just been riding on luck long enough. And it probably took, I don't know, it was probably 10 years or more of just doing that before I ever really thought, like, do I do this? Do this? <laughs> uh, you know, because I think that um, I always enjoy doing all these different various aspects of music for a living yeah I would produce other people's records and I would co-write with other songwriters and I had my own artist project where I started writing songs and singing and dancing and all this kind of stuff so um the film part in particular was just something that I never really pursued it hard it just I opportunities kept coming up organically to collaborate with different people I knew and they'd come back and they'd say you know do you want to work on this project and then 
they tell me about it, I read the script, and I just always had a bad habit of saying yes to everything. <laughs> uh, out of just like a desire to collaborate and, and yeah. you know, um, collaborating with a director is a very different experience than collaborating with another musician. It's just a different kind of of um, a process. And so I've, I've kind of always been drawn to all the different avenues. Of, um, and I think that it's always been propelled out of a sense of learning like i'm i've kind of been fortunate i've had a career of like learning on the job yeah. so i've just learned how to do this by doing it constantly and i guess i just never slowed down to really think about wanting to do it because before i knew it i already was right and were you ever intimidated by going into film music was that something like oh that is like a completely different realm for me or because i mean versus working with bands and stuff like that and all your other stuff or was it something that you were just like oh this is this is an exciting challenge i'm i'm down for it yeah i don't think i ever separated it in my head that way because uh. i was getting into all of it around the same time um yeah. i was learning to play an instrument i was learning how to work studio equipment i was learning how films are made I was learning how to write and produce with other people. So it was all kind of this hybrid discipline of just learning how to basically tell stories. Right. And so I think I never separated in my head because it just kind of started to seem like that's what I was actually learning how to do. Um, communicate feelings and tell stories. Absolutely. So given that you really do work in almost every part of music and, and do so many different things, and it is kind of just, you know, in, in every kind of corner of your life. So I'm, I'm going to ask a question that maybe is simple on, on the surface, but maybe has a deeper connotations, but you can take it however you perceive it. Uh, what does music mean to you? What does it mean to you as a person, as a as an artist, as a storyteller, as a human? I'm just curious, what I, however you take that you know, question. I, I feel like it's been such a huge part of my life for, for now longer than it wasn't that it seems it's it's almost it's kind of like how do you feel about air you know it's like, right. do you like it's just you like, like living and breathing? I, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's sort of a it's become inseparable from the experience of of my life and I guess I beyond it being um like a career or or a, a you know work or anything like that I just think it's the most fascinating part of being alive like i think yeah. it's 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 a mystery it's it's an endlessly fascinating mystery to me that these yeah. vibrations and air pressure can cause like profound cathartic emotional responses and yeah. and that and, and every every way you get into it that you can like beam that on a frequency band and this little piece of metal in my car can like pick that up and relay something that was recorded onto a piece of copper tape magnetic tape 65 years ago and, and i'm crying you know in the car <laughs> exactly, or like, you exactly. Know, it's just it's insane and so i it just the the more i go into it and the more i learn about it and the more i study and understand you know um how it works it still never explains how it works why yeah. it works and I guess it's like, it, it's an endless reservoir of fascination for me. And I, I, so, I, I don't know, I feel really fortunate that this is where I've been able to spend so much of my time is exploring and, and kind of mining out my own uh, experiences because it really, for me is, um, it's a language and it's the one that I understand better than the, all the other ones. So yeah. I'm much better at communicating a piece, my you know, communicating emotions or, or my feelings or my intentions, or I'm better at understanding them from other people through music. Um, you know, and I've certainly fell in love with more songs than people in my life. So <laughs> it's just like, it just gives and gives and gives, you know, it's, yeah. um, it, Absolutely. It's everything for me. So if we if we kind of pivot and kind of focus solely on on your film film music, um, I'm curious. Uh, I know this this question will depend on can change on on any different project. But where does the first note come from for you? I'm curious. Kind of focus on your process. Where do you like to start 
uh, when you start on a film, do you, uh, I know you work with a lot of uh, collaborators and you have built long lasting relationships, like you've mentioned with the people who have tricked you into doing these things, but, um, and, you know, we, we'll get to Hellraiser and, and everything and uh, how you've built all this like stuff. But I'm curious as a starting point, do you like to just sit and talk with the director? Do you like to watch the first cut? If you're on it early enough, just read the script. I'm curious, where do you go for that first kind of idea to pull out of your head? Well, I usually start with one to five anxiety attacks, which <laughs> usually just come in waves for the beginning of every project. Yeah. Um, but you, when you, when you get into doing this, you start to have to develop strategies to navigate around what I call, you know, the 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 terror of the blank page or the mm. blinking cursor syndrome. You know, yeah. where you just kind of show up on day one. It's like, okay, film score okay where you know and you're just like is it this note no nope, it's not that note you know, just it's starting is so hard yeah. and then you just immediately want to give up and go to the bar or, or jump out the window and so I try to find different ways in and um so just as a couple of examples that from recent things is um um on the night house I was able to and you you get these opportunities when you're brought into the process early which isn't yes. always um yeah. but i have been fortunate that's great, starting to happen yeah, yeah. and yeah. with david and jacob and these guys who have been with it they're just like i'm one of the first people that gets called and they're like hey read the script this is the next thing we're doing you know we, you may not we may not really need you for another year but like let's start talking about it now yeah and so um in the case of the night house i was writing while they were shooting and I had read the script and David and I did lots of story conversations and breakdowns prior to even casting so by the time they're on set I was able to go to set and for for a film like the night house where the geography of the location is so much a part of uh, the story it was sort of like well here's uh, an opportunity to draw inspiration from things and just look for things to kind of uh, spark inspiration so just looking at the lake that the house looking at the house that is the night house going and kind of being around some of that you just kind of start to soak up some stuff and yeah um like with the night house it was i i, I had a particular response to the lake itself which the house sits on and is a big part of the story and and it was just in trying to um describe the character of lake water that was a big point of, of, of starting point for me was, was try to describe sonically some of the, um, some of the mo uh, thematic stuff that was in the script, all these like mirrored floor plans and mm, yeah. um, um, things like that. And, the, and then the lake, the way you just watch lake water is like, the way I describe it is like, it's never, it's never quite still, even when it seems to be. It's yeah. always just kind of undulating and it's, it's constantly being aggravated by external forces. Whereas an, an ocean has like a rhythm to it and it's kind of its own organism that a lake is just this kind of murky, unstable presence. Yeah. And so it was like, all right, well, what does that feel like? What does that sound like as sound or as music? With Hellraiser, it was um, going back to the source material of Clive Barker's the Hellbound Heart and reading that novel. And for a film series that's based on a literary work by a writer with a really unique sense of prose and um, writing style, I was pulling little phrases and little, you know, he'd have these little things like, um, I would just, I would write down um, little bits of things that jumped out like verge of senselessness mm. and a fitful phosphorescence and another one was um a perpetual tempest just just little word sandwiches in the middle of of otherwise you know flowing sentences it was like what is a verge of senselessness let me let me use that as like let me pin that to the wall and just play yeah. around today and when i need to orient myself just look up and go back to that phrase and just go we're just trying to describe that and it's just the way all these things are just experiments to get started so that you spend less time at the bar, you know, throwing back shots to calm your nerves <laughs> and more time just making stuff that will yeah. eventually lead you into. But sometimes it begins with melodies and the pursuit of, of music. 
and when I say mus musical music, and sometimes it's just trying to create sounds that that will inspire music. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, that you worked with, you know, David Bruckner, and then also another collaborator. I mean, you have a few, but Jacob Gentry is another big one of yours. What you guys did last goodbye, yeah. and the Signal, Synchro City, uh, Broadcast Signal Intrusion, Night Sky, among others. And of course, David, The Ritual, The Night House, and, and of course, Hellraiser. So when you build these kind of relationships with filmmakers, I'm curious, how is those how have those relationships evolved like over the course of the years? Has it gotten easier to work with each other? Has it gotten more difficult because they know all your maybe like your tricks and maybe like little <laughs> weaknesses and they go like, oh no, I see you doing this again or something. Oh, I'm curious, or is it just the trust has now built so much where it's just like they kind of just like we're you just are in it with your friends and you're just making something cool? <laughs> well, it's a little bit of all of those things. And I mean one one way that um it when you say how it's developed is Jacob was the guy from that original first opportunity in college yeah. and tricked me into doing it in the first place. So I have him yeah. to thank for even being here at all and for continuing to give me opportunities to, to, to learn how to do this on his films. And if it wasn't for his encyclopedic knowledge of film to help me learn how to do it, um, he, he would never claim to know anything about how to write the music but he knows how to tell the story. And that's yeah. so much of the job that I, I learned a lot through the process of coming up with those guys. And even before the movies that anybody saw that we were doing it with Bruckner as well, we were all, you know, shooting experimental shorts and, and, and doing music videos. And we were running around doing commercials for local businesses. So it was just, it was just this process of learning. And, and some of them were expressions that served the function of creating other ones. And, so anyway, when you when you go through all those different kinds of experiences and you're working on so many different formats and mediums and you have to communicate in so many different ways um, for each, then uh, it kind of sharpens all the different uh, areas of, of what it takes to, to conquer a feature. And in particular, a little closer to the question you asked is, is um, yeah, it gets a little harder to trick those guys and to, like, to kind of fool them into like, you know, you like this, right? And they're like, no, you've done that before. <laughs> We've already been there. Um, and, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that's developed is that amount of trust. It, it, yeah. is, the, um, it is the degree to which I know they're counting on me to bring something to it and to help provide something that gives the film a, like a unique sonic identity in addition to providing music and, and helping tell a story they, they, they they're looking for me to me to help bring in something that is um the the area of the story that you that they need help to tell that you can't write and you can't shoot Mm. You can't have an actor do it. You, you can't have the camera do it. it. It's it's a part of this of the story that those guys identify. Either you can only tell, or at least you can best tell with music. Yeah, and you know, it's a unique. Uh, Dan Bush is another guy who was you know Dan was the third part of the director trilogy with Jacob and Bruckner who did the Signal. Yes, and yeah. so with Dan as well is like every opportunity to work with these guys again and to continue to make things with people who you have so much history with, you get a different level of immersion into the project and into, um, you know, their vision for it. And do you, I mean, I mean you probably also feel more, uh, I guess, almost like, I guess, a safe space where you can be more vulnerable and maybe try some crazy, you know, crazy crap that maybe like, you're like, oh, let's just throw some stuff and see what works. And uh, maybe be like, hey, I can, if you feel more comfortable, like pitch something like, I know this might not work, but let's try it anyway, versus maybe some on a first time director that you don't really know. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. And, and that's true. I, I can just, I, I have no problem sending them something that is so dressed down because yeah. I don't, you know, I, they know, and I know, and I know that they know. And so you don't even have to bother with qualifying it in any way. Right. Um, you know, when, when those guys are on set or when, when Bruckner's off shooting, I know I can just send them stuff with no real explanation and it's just a bunch of random numbers and half of it isn't even musical. It's just might just be a minute and a half of a weird noise, but it's just something yeah. that I'm like, I don't know. What do you think? You know? And then, 
he can know without needing to ask that like yes a hundred other things need to go on here but is does that feel like the movie to you right and when we can communicate with that sort of shorthand it's a real unique gift and well, when you're working with like collaborators that you've been working on your entire career do are are, are people like jacob and david are they using uh temp tracks still are they helping that shaping and then how does that influence you and how pressured are you to follow that or they try to keep that away from you i know some directors will do a temp track and maybe never show it to the composer or something like that yeah um it depends uh like on it, and and like with all these things um it, it tends to depend on when you come into the project and with right. those guys i come in pretty early very early sometimes so on something like just to give a couple of examples on something like the night house i had so much stuff to written demos sounds ideas sketches that we never really had to tempt with anything other than demos of the score so yeah. i gave bruckner and the editor so much to work with from the time they started cutting that we never really had to bother doing that um hellraiser i tempt it you know mm. they started one in the edit and then david when he had to finish the director's cut we sat and just i helped build out the temp on that because it was part of the process of figuring out what kind of score was going to work for this how much do we need to make it feel like the originals how much of the original is going to work right. in this um, where where do we zig and zag on trying to make it feel different and what does that different sound and style feel like for just what's working with the visuals with jacob he is so much more involved so early with the music that he's he's one of the only directors who i encourage them to tell mm. because he takes it's a very different process with him it's you know tim can can be so scattershot and just so all over the place pulling yeah. from 50 different places but jacob will limit himself to a, a smaller number of scores and you know he'll do things like repeat a theme from a piece of temp music where it would be even if it's not quite right like all temp isn't but even if it really is kind of it really stands out a little too much but it's to indicate whatever our theme is there i think it comes back here whatever the, the thing that's part of the mystery thing here so he spends a lot of time doing that and it's extremely instructive. Um, I, I don't always, it's not always like a one-to-one -one roadmap, but it does give me a sense of how he's thinking about the movie. And he zeroes in on really specific musical palettes. So with mm. something like Synchronicity, he was entirely pulling John Michael Jarre and Vangelis and Wendy Carlos and just using like a handful of that stuff with broadcast signal intrusion it was michael small and it was all of this you know it was clute and um all the presence men and um things from the late 70s and this kind of post jazz um you know uh conspiracy thriller era of, of yeah. film and it's a it's it's great because a lot of times you sit down and one of the first things to have to kind of figure out which happens along the way is just what is this movie sound like what kind of score is going to work for this or do you want what what do i feel what do i want to do you know meeting halfway with what's going to work you know because i don't have a particular like oh this is my thing i do this you know right right um harpsichord and 808 or whatever it's <laughs> like you know it's just like you know what's the story need and what seems like an interesting challenge and something i haven't done before yeah absolutely so uh, let's let's pivot to to Hellraiser because I mean this is uh when, when, I mean when this was when David brought this to you I'm sure you're like okay this I mean you're not only is it a well known uh novella that you know Clive Barker did that mm -hmm. you guys were working off of but of course Clive Barker did his version in '86 or seven I think the original one was mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. who wrote and directed it so the author is part of it so those those visuals are very much coming from him as well so of course you you guys are gonna be compared to that one so I'm curious. How did you, you were talking about zigging and zagging and how do you navigate Hellraiser? So when you got, when you sat down with David at the beginning, it's like, how do we navigate this? How, how do we make it our own? How do we make it, uh, or is it supposed to remind people of the original? And how did you navigate maybe Chris Young's score as well, which is always also very well regarded. So I'm curious, how, what was the starting point in those conversations? 
Well, yeah, you know, we knew that we were going into something that was so beloved and revered. And, you know, an early conversation on that was, um, you know, how much of that do we emulate um, everything that we've seen and heard done before in that world? And how much do we give ourselves license to explore and reinvent? Um, and I think we knew that the right answer was some combination of the two. Mm -hmm. The spirit of the whole thing was reinvention. And so it, it only felt right uh, and necessary to try to find and describe a, a sound uh, for this new direction. But at the same time, to, to, to David and I both, it was just like, yeah, but those Chris Young scores are what part of what make it feel like Hellraiser. Right. And so if we, if we made too much of a departure with so many other fundamentally identifiable characteristics changing visually and with the mythology and all these other aspects, um, it would probably be a risky, you know, endeavor to abandon the sonic territory that's kind of been laid out for what these films sound like and how they operate. Yeah. Um, I always thought it was interesting uh, too, that the original had a, because there was a, uh, I think Clyde Barker wanted Coyle to do the score first, right? Mm -hmm. And I think they got right. rejected and mm -hmm. Chris came in and replaced it. So that I think they released an album of stuff that was supposed to be for Hellraiser. Did you ever listen to any of that or ever contemplate touching that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I went into all of that, listened to all the Coyle stuff. I listened to both of the first two Chris Young scores for the original and Hellbound. Um, I was kind of soaking up everything I mm. could. I mean, even down to like, the Motorhead cover of Ozzy Osbourne's Hellraiser, yeah. which, you know, just just a song, but it's Hellraiser and it was yeah. inspired by his love of the movie. And so it was just like, what can I take from all of these data points? And um, I think when you listen to the score that we made, it's the answer is kind of like a little bit of all of that is in yeah. there, really. In, it influenced, there were, there, were, there were pieces of that stuff that really guided me. Um, into building something that felt like it kind of captured all of that and but nothing more uh so than than the original chris young scores Absolutely. and part of that was because i think that the way his music works in relationship to the visuals you have this very elegant romantic lyrical melodic music with these very kind of coarse gritty just tough imagery image system to look at um and there was like a marriage there that was very groundbreaking very unique and i think that his scores are what really brought the the fantasy into it and it brought the yeah. magic into the story those things are suggested on screen a little but i think you really feel it and it really sells um, because of the way those scores operate. So I knew there was something there. We, we didn't want to abandon because I think that's what helps separate Hellraiser from all of its peers, yeah. both then and now, um, is its approach to the juxtaposition of the music to the visuals. Um, and so we knew that that meant the orchestra. We knew that that meant um live musicians and and trying to write a bit in the style of the way those films feel and flow but then the the next step of that was um, it was important to to david that we try and actually bring some of those original themes into the film yeah. you know i think as david being such a longtime fan of the original it just was it was such a dream for him to direct something like this that it would be such an opportunity missed to not hear those themes reprised um and so that added another level of complexity as well of, of both the logistical side of kind of working that out and figuring out how that was going to work both creatively and logistically and then executing that in a way that felt seamless and just worked right into you know the score that we made for the film absolutely and then the final result is i mean fantastic i mean I, I checked it out and it's incredible and the the response to it is i mean I, i've talked to a lot of people who just really thoroughly enjoyed it because i mean in, in this age you see 
these kind of movies you know uh, franchises kind of come back and stuff and that it doesn't always hit but i think you and david did something yeah awesome it really it felt it felt like it came from the heart felt like a passion project if there's a lot of passion behind it and it definitely i think resonates on the in the final film for sure <laughs> thanks man i appreciate it. i i saw a comment when the trailer first came out and and it was it was it was one comment that just said like oh this looks this looks actually looks really awesome or at least passionately made. And I remember I really appreciated that because it was yeah. like, yeah, if you, you say what you will, or I'm not going to convince everyone they need to like it or love it. Right. But I hope that at least it comes across that we really cared. We really busted our ass on this thing to try to give everybody, you know, an, another story that could exist within that original set of ideas that Clive had that sprang out of that novel. Yeah, it's it's we're going back to before they made the first film, right? And starting there, so it's just another story that you could tell within that universe. And I felt like um, it was a great opportunity to get to do that and not feel limited to just you know this one version of of of, our, of um, interpretations of that. Absolutely. So looking back, I mean, looking at the project, are there any scenes, uh, sequences, characters that really kind of spoke to you that you look back and that was like, oh, that was a lot of fun mm -hmm. to do? Like any kind of yeah. favorites that you have? Well, it's so, I mean, one of the things that makes one of the, like the defining things that that separate Hellraiser is the existence of the Cenobites. Mm. You know, the, the, these characters are pretty unique for, especially within the genre, because they're not particularly evil characters they're just you know they just kind of have a twisted sense of a good time really yeah. <laughs> you know they're they're just kind of they just want to bring you it to their party and show you how they get down and, you know fortunately it's usually not the party you want to go to but you know the the evil component of every hellraiser story is usually reserved for a human character and the Cenobites are just kind of like, you know, hey, come with us, you know, let us show you these that you're you can feel sensation beyond your wildest dreams. Um, and so that demons to some angels to others aspect of that, which is, you know, the famous description of them sort of gave us uh, this interesting opportunity to say, well, the demon side of that has been pretty well represented in this Canada films. What if we really lean into the angel side of that description? And so there was a lot of effort put into the beauty of them, even though it's horrific when you get up close, but they're, they're striking and, and they, they have a certain kind of um, quality to them that's it's grotesque, but it's quite beautiful at the same time. Mm -hmm. And where that came to, um, how would we reemploy the original theme for the Cenobites that Chris Young had set up in those original movies, which is always employed as this really big, bold, brass fanfare. It's this, and it's like, that's, that's Doug Bradley. That's that pinhead. That's that's those versions of those guys, whereas ours and particularly Jamie's performance in her version of the character, it just called for something very different. And so it was an, an exciting and new opportunity to take a melody that already existed and was already associated with these characters, but then have the opportunity to reinterpret it, change it you know, twist, bend, torture it, you know, try, try to figure out how can we take that and make it into something that, that feels like our own. So in terms of a scene, I would just say anytime they're on screen, um, the way we're employing the Cenobite theme, the, the music for those characters and particularly for Pinhead was so much uh, inspired by Jamie's performance, the design of the characters, the costume, the, the the way they appear and the way they operate on screen really guided me into something that could lean more into this twisted spirituality. You know, this um, there was kind of a divinity to yeah. how Jamie portrayed the character that I that I was really responding to and trying to sort of be her dance partner on. Absolutely. Well, I, it definitely. I mean, that's what comes comes across, and I think the music is such a integral part of it and it brings the whole world to life and the imagery that you know david came up with and it's just 
It's great. So <laughs> I want to congratulate you on it's such on an opportunity to be creative. Yeah. You know, there's so yeah, much there's so, opportunity yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. It was a blast. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's rare to be given something as conceptually bonkers as Hellraiser to begin with. Right. I mean, Clyde Barker's imagination like, alone such, just to work with. Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing's nuts. You know, there's just chains <laughs> flying out of nowhere and everything. And it's, and it's great and it works. And yeah. It's just, it's so bug nuts to begin with in the best way. Right. That but that's what filmmaking like, is about. That's like the core of filmmaking. And that's what you yeah. what you loved, what I love about it, and why I always fell in love with it as a kid. And it's like it's like movies like these that like it's like where you just get to tap into not just, you know, yeah, there's beautiful dramas about reality and things, but when you get into the supernatural yeah. and the things that are just not tangible in real life and you get to create worlds and stuff like I mean, so and much beyond fun. the need to explain because there's not really a point yeah. like where are those chains coming from? I don't know. <laughs> that you probably don't want to find out <laughs> exactly it's just, it's just part of what it is and you just go with it and you just go well wow you know this is a lot of fun to play with yeah absolutely well uh ben thank you so much for taking the time to to talk about your process today and and shed a little light into your approach and your your background and and taking us uh, into Hellraiser and everything that that went into it. Uh, I really appreciate your time. I've been a huge fan of your work and continue to always look forward to whatever comes next. And uh, I mean, the recent stuff you've been putting out with like Night, you know, Night House, Night Sky and and this. And I mean, just awesome. The Ritual was also very great. Really enjoyed that one too. So, <laughs> Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, these are great questions. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>